we go, this outline is going to form the fullness of Christ, the body of Christ. I'm going to be asking for you to help me identify barriers to the fullness of Christ and bridges toward it as a mixed group like we are. Okay, so that's where we're going. I'm going to be asking for your help. <clears throat> it's like you know in Paul, Paul says in Ephesians 4, there is one faith. That's what he says. There is one faith. And he says other things about one, one baptism, one faith, one Lord. And yet, we are called into various vocations. We have different jobs to do in that one faith, don't we? We're called to various missions. We have different tasks in that one faith. What holds us together? And especially, um, especially challenging in a group like this. Now, we have a weekend like this, and it's a little, it's, it's enjoyable, but, but partly because of that diversity. But when you go into your home communities, when you feel a little bit more left alone, sometimes you can wonder, what, what holds this group together? How, what do I have in common with you? What do you have in common with me? I've already, I've already talked a bit about, just to rehearse some of where we've been, <clears throat> we've always got in mind some kind of place where we think we're going to do our best, where we think we're going to contribute, where we think our lives are, in our language, where we're going to make a difference, right? We always have in view a place of shalom or flourishing. That's why we live, is to move toward that picture we've got in mind where we think we're going to flourish. It's kind of like this. Um, in our area, and I'm just, I'm just summarizing, I'm rehearsing where we've been. In our area, we have numerous kinds of migratory birds. It's come something of a corridor where a lot of different kinds come through. And uh, because of that, we see lots of different kinds of birds at different seasons, there's large geese and cranes, and there's these tiny little ducks that can't even take off on ground. They need water to take off. Um, you could ask yourself, why do they do that? Why do they migrate? How, how do they overcome the powerful forces of wind and hunger and fatigue that doing something like migrating requires of them? When you stop and you look at it a little bit longer, you realize it's not like they just like having fun because they value the challenge. Um, it's not about that. It's not just because they think that pain is weakness leaving the body, you know, and, and because of that they like the challenge of migrating. It's something more. Something more. These migrating birds, these tiny little ducks and these large cranes, they're born in the north places like where we live, and their parents feed them with bursting populations of bugs and lush plants, and they mature, and the cold starts to set in, and they travel south because their food is getting scarce, sometimes thousands of miles. So it's, not, it's not just because of the challenge. It's not just because they like flying in formation. It's not just a matter of going against the flow. Right. I'm suggesting they've got a vision of where they're heading in a way that a bird could, you know. But they've got a vision of where they're heading. It's a place where their young are going to flourish, where it's going to reach its fullness, and also a place where they're just going to be in touch with the seasonal way that the world really works. Okay. And that's a lot like you and I. We've all got in mind some picture or another of a destination. Where are we heading? Where am I going? Where do I think I'm going to find life? <clears throat> and like I'd outlined earlier, we've got a lot of destinations to choose from, don't we? I'd like to offer here in this session one image. Okay? One image of what it looks like to build Christ's city. Before we identify some barriers and bridges to its construction. And I'm addressing you here as a mixed group. One body, one faith, one Lord, and yet 
some of you preparing deeply, carefully, in focused ways to serve specific, to serve specific missions as emissaries of God's city. And there's others still, still the ambassadors, still sent, but called to missions that maybe just don't require the same kind of preparation. So what mission is big enough for all of us? What can keep us in the spirit of builders, not squabblers? That's the challenge. And the image is this. It's Christ's fullness. Okay. I'll describe that and then we'll talk about bridges and barriers. Fullness. It's back in Ephesians 4 again. Look at it if you like to. Um, fullness. It's, it's the sense of being at capacity. Right? That's what it means when something is full. The cup is about to overflow. It's full. <clears throat> when my heart is bursting. It's full. The, the word can also describe completion. For example, Jesus fulfilled the law. He brought it to fullness, completion. He rounded it out and filled it up. And especially in Ephesians and Colossians, it's true of Paul, that he uses the word fullness to describe the ministry of Christ and our goal as well. It's the place where we're all heading. This is what we're doing. It's what we're sent to do. And after Paul too, Christians took this up and they, they had a way they had a way of um, trying to describe how Jesus is the ghoul of every part of the world. Not only was Jesus the fullness of the law, he's the fullness of the world, the whole world. <clears throat> and so they tried to describe Jesus as the entire ghoul, the place where the whole creation is being swept along and heading to. Now, that can be hard to believe sometimes, can't it? But it, I think it's biblical, it's true. The whole creation is being swept along and eventually it's going to come to Jesus. It's like Paul says, he is, Jesus is, above every principality and power and every name that is named. All cosmic beings are subject to Jesus. They find their fullness in him. Nature bows to him in the Gospels. Thus, nature finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And he is everything. He is everything that was intended in a human being. He's the new Adam. Okay. If you want to know what a human being looks like, look at Jesus. That's the claim there. That's filling. That's fullness. We look at Jesus and we begin to understand that our salvation is filled out in Him. Our idea of what a good life looks like is full and complete in Jesus. And everything that we learn about a ruler, everything we learn about a city or a king is completed in him. And it can go on. It all answers back to him. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In him, the whole fullness of deity, catch this, dwells bodily. That's the claim of Paul. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Those are big claims. So the entire creation has been brought into being in, to enter into Christ's reign so it too can be filled up. So it can enter his life and thus become everything God intends for it. So that Christ may finally be all in all. That's where it's all going. Well, what does this have to do with us? Okay, that's interesting. What does this have to do with us? Well, we're, the, the invitation to us, and this is startling. <laughs> I, I'll never get over this. The invitation for us is to enter in. It's to participate. To bow the knee. To, to, to have ourselves filled up by him and through, and in, and because of, and, be, and before, and under Jesus. It all answers back to him. And we are ordained priests 
and ministers of that message. Be reconciled to God. Enter his fullness. And and we are called to build whatever bridges we can to Christ's fullness and remove whatever barriers remain. Because there are still barriers. And we recognize too that Christ gave his body various ministries all gathered around his fullness. He gave some apostles, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 11 to 15, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Because they like the challenge? Because they enjoy flying in formation? No. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up The body of Christ. The body of Christ. That's his his living presence here on earth. It's the church. And right away I start asking questions. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. To what extent? How long should we go on building the body of Christ, Paul? When should we stop? Well... Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That's how long. Okay? How long will that take? That sounds like a life calling, doesn't it? To the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And he goes on, well, what what would that look like then? What would happen? That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Here's the how. How are you going to do this? But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We're called to nothing less than this, folks. In our various missions and callings and whatever preparation we undertake, seek the fullness of Christ. Seek the fullness of Christ. Add some bulk to the body of Christ until we grow up into him in all things. But now again, and here I'm going to start to turn here toward bridges and barriers. Some of us are preparing deeply to serve specific missions as emissaries in God's city. Maybe these are the arms of the body of Christ. I'm not sure. And others function in different capacities in Christ's body. It takes a big mission to keep us from squabbling from turning feet against heads, hands against hearts. It takes nothing less than asking, does my attitude, does my preparation present a barrier to the fullness of Christ? Or is it a bridge toward it? It's like Paul challenges that constantly troubled church in Corinth, we've always got to be asking ourselves, is this expedient to the fullness of Christ? Or am I putting up a barrier? Does it make clear and straight a path to promote the fullness of Christ in this or that situation I'm facing? Or does it put a crook in the road? So this is going to be our work. We'll first start with the nasty stuff, which may be easier, I don't know. And we'll identify some barriers. And I'll give you an example here of what I mean by a barrier. I'm thinking in terms of this mixed group. I'm thinking of um, one example when I asked my parents about this. They were out as part of the body of Christ to help us when our infant son was born. 
And uh, some years ago, before I started graduate studies, I was seeking a blessing from them. I didn't even know totally that's what I wanted from them, but I think that's what I wanted. I went out for supper with them, my wife and I, and I was hoping for some input and I was hoping for their blessing. And I admit, I just admit being a little bit disappointed when they offered this, don't be deceived. That was the extent of it. That's good advice. But can you understand why I might be a little bit disappointed? Okay. It was kind of limited, too. And when we talked later on, a few weeks after that, my mother offered, well, she asked a question. She asked me, will you be studying theology in um, graduate studies? And I said, yes, I'll be studying theology. And she said, well, she looked online, she said, and she learned that theology is the study of God. And she felt good about that. And she blessed that. Study theology because it's the study of God. And I, we, we could laugh about that a little bit. I, I wouldn't like that too much <laughs> because my mom offered me something there. Okay? But you can understand, what's, what's the barrier? What's the barrier that could come out of that? For after the fullness of Christ, what's the barrier? I'll give you this one. The next one's on you. <laughs> At one level, I think that's just a story, you know, about um, parents and their children. A son doing something that his parents might not fully understand or even appreciate. But let's say I let that lodge deeply in myself. My mom and dad couldn't bless me and they didn't even understand what I'm doing. How might that develop into a barrier to the fullness of Christ? I'm looking for some response. Yeah. This is something... Educated people struggle with too, maybe especially. Part of being educated is feeling constantly like an imposter. Surprising. Feeling rejection, responding out of that. Is there anything in that little story that maybe is a little bit less personal? If you feel rejection personally. What was I going to do in my graduate studies that my mom wasn't. Study theology. Could theology be a barrier to the fullness of Christ? Maybe it's study. Okay. Take that in context, please. Um, I just, I'll, offer, I'll offer this. By studying theology, part of what I'm doing and part of what education means, and this is what it means, I'm going to be entering into a world of specialized language. The way I said it there, how do you like that? I'm going to be entering into a world of specialized language, won't I? I'm going to learn some words that my mom doesn't know. Hypostatic union. I'm so smart. Um, bear with me. But I'm also going to be reading books my mom hasn't read. I'm going to learn to admire people that my mom doesn't even know. Okay. And, and as I go, there is the possibility here that there could be a growing gap. There's going to be the overlap that for my parents assumed is like this, it's going to start to go like this, and then eventually it might even go like that. And it won't hold quite so much in common anymore. And it could go further than that. There's going to be that growing gap. What if I can't accept or even access the wisdom of my parents any longer? Okay. What if I go high 
and uh, start to feel smug about my ability to describe things. Right? Well, what if my parents feel threatened? Because this works both ways, that smugness can. What if my parents start to feel smug about how little they can describe? That's possible too. Or they feel threatened. Just don't see the value in what I'm doing. Can you see how those become barriers? No? And here I want to hear some from you. That's one for myself. It is a relational one with my parents. I'll just pose the question to you. What barriers... What barriers specific to education have you encountered? Which have come up for you? And what are those? You can speak either as somebody who's witnessed somebody being formed or educated or somebody who's going through that process yourself. Barriers to the fullness of Christ. Yes, Titus. You have a name tag. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you say more about overtrust? Overtrust of what? Good, well said. So sometimes mistrust, would say, if you're experiencing the rejection, it's going to be very easy for you to feel mistrustful, right? But but sometimes there can also develop an overtrust in other areas. I'm hearing you right. Good, what else? Barriers to the fullness of Christ. Please. Now that I have it succinctly, but um, I've had the sense that the experiences that I have in education are so far different from mm-hmm. the lives of people who were close to me that they almost can't relate at all. And it just creates relational distance mm-hmm. because of the extreme differences of experience. Mm-hmm. So it's like the experiences themselves, they're just not shared. And they can over time develop. Something of a distance there. Yeah, and I think that uh, for us, in, in my way of thinking, to grow into the fullness of Christ, those relationships have to continue to, uh, to grow. There mm-hmm. has to be some level of shared experience. Mm-hmm. But that distance between the experiences we've had presents a barrier to, how do you say, easier relationships. Mm-hmm. At least a friction starts to develop there, or at least something, someplace to pay attention to. Yeah, and like they, when I say, oh, this is what I'm struggling with, they can't be like, oh, I can totally relate. Yeah, they person. can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, good, well said. <clears throat> Keep going. I found in my own uh, higher education studies, some of them, and observing others that there's a time crunch. Mm hmm. We become so involved with our studies and our life that we don't have time to develop a a walk in that fullness. Mm -hmm. So you can become so focused on the studies, the requirements of your training, you can start to lose touch with the fullness of Christ. Good. Yes. Back to the thought there of your mother and you telling her that you're going to study theology. Yeah. So... Your mother has also studied theology. Yes. But her main source has been the Bible. Okay. And so why, if we have the ultimate source of theology, why does my son need to study theology from Luther and mm. Calvin and all these other people that our forefathers severed their way from? Mm-hmm. So it has to do with what sources you're going to. And mm-hmm. the, uh, the students showing ultimate respect for the source that their parents... Uh, had for their theology or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
There's a question of authority in there too. Is that right? What, what's trusted, what's deemed as trustworthy? And if you're starting to work with Luther and some Reformed folks, so it's, that's a little bit different. Right. Yeah. Good. Keep going. I don't want to stay here too long. I want to get to the bridges for sure. Yeah, building off of that, I think it's possible, whether in formal education or otherwise, to be encountering new slash different theological yeah. positions yeah. that will potentially duck, juxtapose you with the rest of your community. Good. This one can become important, and it can be, it's a question I've sometimes had to wrestle with. You know, uh, what, if, what if I come to a position that's different than that of my community? You know, a real barrier. One more? I'll give you a few of my own as well. I've had more time to think about this. What are we missing? Pride. Okay. Anything specific to education? That sounds like a human problem. Okay. Pride and knowledge. Now there's a combination. Take a heart of pride. Give it some knowledge. Now you've got an empowered pride. Is that a barrier to the fullness of Christ? You see why? Okay. How about this one? And this comes in our circles for good reason. Um, <clears throat> knowledge without practice. He's gone so far up the ivory tower, he's of no earthly good. It's like Colossians 2.3 reminds us, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay. It comes, it fits well alongside this major biblical call to know the Lord. As we know Christ, we learn wisdom. And we access true knowledge. But here's the thing with true knowledge, it comes from practice. It doesn't just come from downloading encyclopedias. It comes from practice. And when, you, when, the, when in Scripture, in the New Testament, talks about the knowledge of Christ, it, it includes some of that mastery, the hard work of thinking and disciplining yourself. It includes that. But the real focus, the real focus is learning how to wisely show up with the presence of Jesus. That's knowledge in the strict New Testament sense. And there, there's other kinds of knowledge. It's something of a loose word. Um, but many times, the kind of knowledge that we, as educated and educators, tend to get access to, it's the kind which tends to puff up. There's that possibility there. Whereas the knowledge that's really promoted in the New Testament is the kind which bears itself out through practice. Making the attempt, getting your hands dirty, showing up for the work project. That kind of knowledge. Another one, I think, I've got to get up here. That's related. Knowledge without love. And Paul is especially hard in that church at Corinth. They seem to operate out of this assumption that it's the people who could really think well um, <clears throat> who are somehow superior, a little bit further up. And Paul is like, you know, really? When that knowledge disappears into sight, the only thing that remains is going to be love. And that, uh, that has a way of putting things in perspective, doesn't it? There's many other barriers I think we can name. What if I come to a wrong conclusion? I don't find, in my experience, that educated people are immune from coming to wrong conclusions. Okay? They do that too. You may sometimes fear that our faith could be overturned entirely. It's not uneducated people who are immune to that. 
or that I might just find some kind of misguided sense of importance just because education prepares me in certain ways. Okay? We could name more. I'll put those on this side. Those are the barriers. Bridges. And we build some bridges to the fullness of Christ. I put the question to you first. Among a group like this, somewhat mixed, some preparing for specific missions, others less or different kinds of preparation, how do we build bridges? Communication. Okay, can you say a little bit more? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it's some of, one of the things that's really powerful if you have groups who are somewhat diverse is um, communication can tend to break down. And we are really good, folks. We are really good at making assumptions about the intentions of other people. We spend a lot of energy doing that. And unless you're willing to communicate, how often have you come away from a conversation with somebody you think is very different than you, and you work it out, you converse, you're willing to have the conversation, and you come away and you're like, I, not only can I understand them, I think I kind of like them, right? If you're not willing to communicate, you can nurse that, you can nurse that prejudice, you can cover yourself over with pride and say, I'm not willing to have that conversation. It's going to go a different direction. Good. Other bridges. <clears throat> A local church commitment. How is that important? Well, part of preparation for future is part of preparation for future work. Yeah, um, they can. You you need them um, for the fullness of Christ to grow into your your mission, whatever that might be. Uh huh. I like the language there. You need them. Um, I have a friend in higher education. He's a professor. He's, he's worked hard at it. He goes to a small church, not far from the school where he teaches, and his church is mixed in vocation. They're, they're not all educators. They're they're not all PhDs. There's plumbers. Um, there's electricians. And he says, "I need my brothers." And he means that in the literal sense, that when he gets in over his head with a plumbing problem, he knows who he's going to call. The world is going to stop if we don't have plumbers, okay, literally. Um, <laughs> whereas there are certain luxuries that you can get away without. <clears throat> a professor of the humanities ought to know that, you know. Yeah, we need each other. We need a local church commitment. We need to learn how to need each other. What else? Another one. Just bouncing from that one or taking it from there, um, the kind of education that I'm getting in training for Bible translation yeah. doesn't naturally feel to my church like I am getting this education to benefit them, mm -hmm. but I still need them, and mm -hmm. um, so that for me that the bridge that I need to build is that when I pull my nose out of the books and away from the screen, mm -hmm. that I'm turning to these people and like really actually enjoying their presence. Mm. Um, so I'm just like kind of fleshing out the thought of that local church commitment, um, and that they're finding that. I'm growing in my walk with Christ through what I'm studying um, and that it is blessing the local church where I am right now. Mm -hmm. I, I notice a number of things going on there. I could keep on going, I think. But at least those two, um, paying attention. Sometimes it takes a little effort to uh, get out of the books, <laughs> doesn't it? 
and we live in such a noisy world. So to pay attention, to pay attention can sometimes mean just showing up <clears throat> in that local congregation you've made a commitment to, showing up and asking the question, what does this place need? And being willing to do that. Okay? And that's the difficulty of specialization. You may not need a Bible translator in your home community. What else do they need? They probably need something. Okay. So pay attention. Attention, I'm just suggesting, attention gives us the chance to fellowship with Jesus. Maybe not by being in the front end of our community, but by asking your community, what do you need? And then being willing to humbly offer that. Okay. Good, keep going. What else? We've got two, go ahead. Just the realization that all truth is from God, that yes. all truth is God's truth, and that the more we exercise in that truth and learn about that truth, it doesn't elevate us, but mm. it shows us how big God is and how much more we need to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, all of us are alike there, and that we're all on this process of God showing a little bit more of himself to us. And nobody is going to absolutely get it all down, because all truth belongs to God, all truth answers back to God, and yet at the same time, I'm not God. Okay? So no matter how many letters behind my name, I can't say I've got it all now. Good. Thank you. Another one? Yes, Titus. Yeah, so it's easy to um, look at a converse of pride there and say humility. So it's something I'm thinking about, and I think it's related to some things we've already discussed, but specifically something that impacted me deeply from someone I count a mentor is humility in the area of uh, recognizing the variety um, of God's people, of believers. So I don't know if this is getting off track in thinking about the fullness of Christ in a body of believers rather than in just one believer. But I have found it um, just remarkably beautiful yeah. when we do recognize that we are different and we are all manifestations of the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we allow ourselves to be, to be redeemed and embrace that. Mm -hmm. Well said. It, 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 that tracks with how Paul talks about this at 1 Corinthians 12. Again, very diverse group of people. Um, they had some struggles. They had some challenges. He, he, says, he says, for the body is not one member but many. Not one but many. Picture a body that's all feet. Or a city that's all tailors. Just won't survive. So remember, remember that no one member has all the gifts. And you could say the other is just as true. Remember also that no one gift is given to all believers. There's various gifts too. And some you sure hope show up in all believers. But there's a lot of gifts that actually don't overlap. Okay, yes. I was just going to say that I found it very... We've, it's been very much a blessing in our church when there's a field member, someone who's been more educated mm -hmm. or someone who's read more widely. If they can bring those concepts back to the church mm -hmm. and bring it down into the language of common people mm -hmm. and build that, take the time, don't assume people understand. Mm -hmm. Like Bring it down, be humble, and talk slowly about it. I think that Jesus did that in his parables. He took very complex spiritual ideas and brought it down to their mm -hmm. level. It builds a lot of trust. Yeah, some folks talk about that as responsible language. And they're, 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 this is where some of the distance can really start to develop. You, you, you come and you start to learn like theology and you start to learn a very general, well, somewhat general, kind of, it's in the field. It's a discipline language. It's a trade language. But then there's other languages here that just more common. For me, it's been really critical, and I'm saying this to those of you getting some training. This is something we have going for us, biblical language, okay? We share that as believers. So learn to use biblical language well and give yourself over to it, submit to it. Okay. That's significant. Others? <clears throat> Other bridges? Take just a couple more perhaps. Maybe offer a few of my own. Yes, one that I have found is 
submission uh -huh. to uh -huh. the authorities in my life. Mm-hmm. Is that always easy? No. 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 Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and that's what I care about. Um, there's submission and closely related to that one in my experience is what I'll call adversity. Okay. <laughs> Challenges. Things don't always go the way I'd like them to. Remember this. Adversity is a normal and it's a good part of life. In fact, it's necessary for our continued growth into the fullness of Christ. I didn't use biblical language there. The biblical language is when Jesus invites us to take up our cross and die. When Paul reminds us that he dies daily, he's, he's saying here, look, it's not always going to feel good or right. And your feelings of what feels good and right aren't always the best indicator of what's good and right. You show up. You offer the presence of Jesus. You ask, what can I do in this context? That might be right, and it might sometimes feel like part of you is dying. That could be okay. That might actually mean you're growing the fullness of Christ. That's easier said than done, by the way. One more? Just briefly. That he should seem other better than themselves. Yes. Could I say service? Esteeming others. Esteem's the better word, I think. Paul uses this language of honor, and it's almost like he's trying to get us into a contest of honoring each other more than we're receiving honor. What would that look like? in a community where each person is going out of the way to show more honor to the other person than they're receiving. <laughs> That's incredible. There's more. Um, I think we've covered a lot here. The one we don't talk about enough sometimes, I think, are the practices of the church. Just showing up. Gathering. Being sent. Showing and being shown hospitality. Um, the Lord's Supper. Remember how deeply divided that church at Corinth was. Paul takes them back to the basics. How are we going to celebrate the Lord's Supper? Okay. Show up. Be present there. Remember your baptism. Remember the vows you made. Practice peacemaking and restitution. Practice forgiveness. Practice being forgiven. Read, interpret scripture together, pray together. Many, many more practices. Concrete ways of showing up, making yourself visible, making it aware that I'm here not to be served, but to serve. And there's many more things. <laughs> we could talk about followership. Learn to be a follower. Okay? It's the primary relationship between a disciple and his Lord. Don't get ahead of your Lord. Follow him. When you come to Jesus, say, you're in charge. Show me. Show me what to do next. Learn to listen. Respond to frank conversation. Cultivate love. Live in faith. We could keep going. I think this is a good list. <clears throat> I want to leave you with a little something here. So let's wrap up. Now back in the day, um, this may surprise you, I don't know. But I used to really enjoy playing football. Uh, this is the American kind. And interestingly, interesting, the last time I played football was in graduate school. That's a different story. It's one I enjoy telling. Um, but we talk about, we would talk about if we played football, we talk about long game and short game. 
Okay? Playing the long game means, uh, means taking in the whole picture and, and thinking ahead. It means letting go of flashy stuff that sometimes works, these band-aid solutions or temporary improvements, and just promoting solid fundamentals. Exercise, lots of practice, commitment. <clears throat> and here I'm drawing in a little bit from where we've been on Wednesday. Um, but Christians today in the West, they've recognized we're settling in for the long game. Okay. Now at the end, as we close up, we have this big picture, the fullness of Christ. It's what we're going for. What does it mean to stay in the long game. And I'll suggest it means nothing less than this. It means the communities where we invest, where we build, where we nurture each other. It is in education. Okay? The long game means education. It's where we prepare our young. There's no shortcuts here. And finally, I think the long game means the fullness of Christ. Focusing on that, making that primary, letting other things be secondary or even third. With lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing in one, with one another in love. For how long? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's not a short-term strategy. Okay? That's not a short-game strategy. Short games assume that it's going to be easy. They assume, they assume that um, we're going to be able to just kind of improvise and it'll all work out. In our context in education, the short game has tended to mean that you might hurl a little apologetics. You might do a Hail Mary, tent crusade, pass out a few tracts, and you win. That world, that world is going away. Okay? And I'm advocating for a long game. We play a strategy of persistent, determined, building toward the fullness of Christ. And in this game, in this world we live in, we can no longer assume that we've got quite so much in common, in the West at least, with our governing culture, and we're going to have to work harder. We're going to have to work harder to prepare people to become Christians and to remain Christians. We'll have to invest deeply. And I do want to recognize, like any transitional time, the time we're living in, <clears throat> at least here in the West, um, can be kind of scary. It's kind of unsettling. There's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of questions. I just consider that an invitation to celebrate deeply what Jesus has done and making himself the fullness. And, and, and also consider an invitation to invest and love deeply especially for us as Anabaptists who've already done some of this marginally well. We make the effort. We order our lives after the fullness of Christ. Seek to serve. Love deeply. Invest habitually and freely. And when the time is right, God will give the increase. One final image. There is in um, Cologne, in Europe, there is a very large cathedral. And the men who laid the foundation of that cathedral in Cologne, they started in 1248, before the Reformation. The last of the construction was ended in 1880. Okay, 1248 to 1880. Those men who laid the foundation stones for that church in Cologne, 
what's remarkable, what's remarkable about them is they knew, they knew they would never worship there. Not only that, they knew their children would never worship there, nor their great-grandchildren or their great-great-grandchildren. And you could go on. They knew that. We're in the long game. Okay. We need builders. We need to keep the fullness of Christ primary. And allow other things to take their secondary place. So build. Build for the fullness of Christ. Build bridges. Not barriers. And build well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have done for us countless things that we can never do for ourselves. And for that, we are forever grateful to you. We freely and humbly bow the knee and bow our heads to you, recognizing that you are Lord and we are not. And we offer ourselves as the kind of living sacrifices who you deem worthy somehow, to participate in the work that you're accomplishing in the world. We love you. We put our confidence in you. In your name, amen. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. All right, so we had two sessions today, and I think we're just going to rewind before we open it up for any comments or questions on the second session to this morning's session, if that's okay. That's fine. So we had a message this morning contemplating the city of God versus the other cities that we might find ourselves being educated by, and uh, I'm going to open it up for any comments or questions on that message. So I'll start out here. Kyle, I know that you represent faith builders, so without building a platform to present faith builders here Mm -hmm. today, I want to ask you, is it actually possible to find a place of learning and education that does not actually decrease our love for the city of God? You said if it doesn't increase our love for the city of God, it's futile. Mm -hmm. Can you point us to an educational system or Uh, location that's a worshiping community, a practicing community, a submitted community, a countercultural city, is this (laughs) even real? (laughs) Or am I just describing something imaginary? Um, I I can't can't totally disconnect myself from my work at Faith Builders, I'll say that. So you might even feel some of that leaking in there, into what I've described as being like a worship, a community, a submitted community. Those are some of the things we talk about. I can't apologize for that, Jewel, <clears throat> but I will say that um, that is leaking in, and, I, and I'm hoping we're, we're working at that, some of that stuff, not perfectly. I don't know, though. I, I'm also convinced, just as equally, by my work at Faith Builders, that, um, that you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't have found, you'll never, you're never going to find all of those things in one place, in my experience. And... So much of what makes Jesus living and well is that it's, he gets the credit always, and he always has places to point out for us to continue to grow. It's usually the idols that are the ones that we think we found it all, and now we just need to preserve that one thing and, and hang on to that. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question except to say, I don't think all of it, except I have found there are pockets and places where I'd go for one thing or the other a little bit more than the others. Okay, thank you. So I'll just come back on that a little bit and say my experience at Faith Builders, as you're describing, it was a place where we could experience and enjoy these things. However, Faith Builders doesn't cover the range of disciplines a group like this is prepared to engage. Mm -hmm. What can you point us to in with the high bar you raised there for education and what we should be looking for at at an educational facility? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to offer us? I, and there I get out of my depth, Joel, where you, you all are the ones who understand the discipline of, say, translation. Um, I would at least offer, I would at least offer that, again, I've, I've valued certain parts of the different aspects of my, 
of my own education. Okay, so where one, for one part of my education might emphasize this or that, I can, I can still find something there. And part of my growing as a person who is truly educated is recognizing there is no one person, there is no human authority that can just give me my calling or a full education on a silver platter and all I've got to do is reach out and take it. That, that's, that's a mistake. So there's no one place that, that can do all of those things. Again, I'm kind of wrestling with the, the possibility of idolatry there. You might have to go to different schools. You might have to become something of an omnivore. And uh, the nice thing about talking about Jesus as the fullness is they're inexhaustible. You're never really going to come to the tail end of it. Okay. That seemed true. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate that. Just stay up here. So who else has a question or a comment in response to either of the two uh, sessions we had? Maybe focusing, first of all, briefly on the uh, session this morning, but really it's, it's open for anything. So flag your hand if you want a mic. That'll be uh, right there for you. Brother Harold. Is it possible to go through higher education and not be influenced by the educator or the institution? No, that's not possible. So do we take the good with the bad? Yes and no. I think influenced, yes, but it's not automatic, right? And um, say in my, when I, I was working on a degree in computer science, one of the things I didn't do was go to Frosh Week at that school. It's the city of workers. What's going to happen in the city of workers at Frosh Week? A lot of drinking, a lot of jockeying to kind of see who's going to be top dog in the school. Um, but that's something that I didn't want to be formed by. And there my, the pastors in my life were very wise in saying I ought not to be formed that way. So you can be selective, but you will be formed. Okay. <clears throat> Are some of these cities uh, present in other aspects of life, not just in mm -hmm. academia? Yes. The city of uh, self-expression, the city yes. of uh, putting success on a pedestal, dot, dot, dot. Yes, absolutely. I, I wonder, could you say a little bit more? Why are you asking? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to say, but I think mm -hmm. some of it is simple human nature. And, yeah. you know, Jesus talked about the, mm -hmm. you know, the lust for power, the lust for riches, mm -hmm. and the following your own ideology rather than yeah. looking to God for the source of life and wisdom. Yeah. There has always been a Babel. There's always been an Assyria. I would say schools have, even though school looks a little bit differently now than what it might have during some times in history, a school has always been a place where the people who have in mind a certain view of what the city is going to be, whatever that city is, it's a place where there's a transition that happens, okay, from that person being a novice in the city to being a full participant. What that looks like is going to vary depending what city you're trying to enter. But that's usually what school or education has meant, the transition. And it's like, oh, you're going to be youth when you enter, and then you're fully initiated. Now you're a member of that. And that's part of what the school has been there to help with in the ideal world. So I have a question, Kyle. Uh, you talked about three cities. Um, so juxtaposed with the city of God or the kingdom of God, yeah. we have the world and its systems. Mm -hmm. um, building off of what James, Brother James just asked, um, could we, is there a one-to-one -one correlation between the city of workers, the city of expressive individualism, and the city of thinkers, and this unholy trilogy, the lust of the flesh, mm. the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Has that question ever come up before in your contemplation of this? No, it never has. That's... And somebody else had made a connection between, there's that, there's the world system on one and a brother I was talking with at lunch. He had made the connection also between love of God, heart, soul, mind, strength. So <laughs> there it is. Some of the possibilities where the school could be an entrance into the world or it could be a passage 
into the love of God in its fullness, right? Mm -hmm. No, that hadn't been pointed out. That's good. What would you say would be a good way to encourage, if you're the family or sending church for someone who does need to pursue this education Mm -hmm. in order to serve God, how would we admonish or encourage them? Mm Mm-hmm. How do you encourage or admonish somebody who's seeking higher education? This is a good group to ask that question to. I would enjoy especially hearing from people who've gone the route of further education. What was helpful to you? It's going to vary a little bit, I think. Um, In my experience, I couldn't always put words to it, and it didn't matter. the people who just took an interest and were willing to even do the things of saying, hey, our family is doing this certain thing this evening, would you be interested in coming along for that? So paying attention to who it is that's present, like if you have a single person in your community that's there because of higher education, they might be really missing their family. So you can be a little bit of a family for them. Um, if they're... If they need a sounding board for some of the things they're encountering, you might be able to be that sounding board. Um, There's a lot of different possibilities. Am I even beginning to answer your question? Maybe it has to do with paying attention. I don't know. It's a very good question. I could say more out of my experience there. It's escaping me right now. I would offer something on that, Melody. So um, Kyle's uh, parents' response, don't be deceived. He admitted that he was hoping for more than that. Mm -hmm. I would offer that uh, you could encourage, and we heard this coming up earlier, encourage the young person to make sure they're studying their own history. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. knowing where we came from and why we do the things we do, if you don't understand that there's a chance you'll probably attach to someone who does know how to describe Mm -hmm. their history and why the things why they do the things they do Mm -hmm. good and I frequently encourage to people who are going into something really specialized um, psychology nursing something to do with the natural sciences perhaps more and more I'm like do some bible and church history too uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the really noticeable things about many schools these days is how fragmented each of the disciplines is because there's so much depth of knowledge in each different discipline that they're just struggling to keep up with that, let alone to bring in other disciplines. So if I've got somebody who's just, all they want to do is go and study mechanical engineering, like, can you pick up some Bible and theology maybe at a different school and bring that in? If you're very focused on just getting your degree, bring that in. To that school as a transfer credit or something like that. So I'd advise them that way too. So for context, I'm at Moody Bible Institute and in some ways I feel like it's making me a better Anabaptist in that Anabaptists care about, forgive me, but generally how you dress, do you believe in non-resistance, stuff like mm-hmm. that. And uh, Calvinists are pretty heavy in the doctrine. Yes. And they like to dig into the scriptures. Yes. And uh, so it's been really good to see where I come out in believing in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my question is, how much of a target do you make yourself at school? Mm. Is that even wise? Or do you just go to school, do your stuff, take the exam, mm-hmm. just live a life of uh, consistency and answering questions when they come? Do you ever feel like it's good to try to be a voice of change in a school? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, And I would, would, if you're in a more reformed context, you're going to be in a context where verbal expression is really appreciated and you would be a target there by questioning things, maybe, by saying, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about double predestination. Can we talk about the predestination of Christ first before we talk about that and you would start to make yourself a target in that way in a context like that. Um, it was interesting for me in my, it was in my graduate experience at a, a seminary near Pittsburgh where 
I was expecting more resistance. I was expecting to have to constantly defend myself, right? Um, and there were times where I needed to do that, especially among the Lutherans. We could have that conversation. And there I was a little bit less afraid to put myself out. But there were other times where not only did I feel like there was people who were worth paying attention to where I could bring Christ's presence there too, uh, and I did that as an Anabaptist did. You know, we have some gifts to offer in those contexts. So I could bring some of the gifts of being an Anabaptist. What I felt when this surprised me was that I began, and I don't say this lightly, I, I began to feel respected, not because I was a potential Anglican, but because I was an Anabaptist. Okay. Because I brought to that context not just a great ability to express myself or something, but because I knew what respect meant. I knew how to honor my professors by turning things in. And um, they even started to harbor suspicions that I showed up on time for my appointments because of my views of non-resistance. And they had to explain that one to me. <clears throat> Maybe there was something to it, but I, didn't, you know, I wasn't taking it that seriously. But they saw connections there. And at the end of that experience, that, that respect had grown into something that they, they, uh, uh, they commended the kinds of things, the kinds of character, the kinds of contribution I brought to that community as an Anabaptist. And I came away saying, I'm keeping that. And they said, you keep that. Okay. I don't know how to reconcile all that. Is that connecting? Yeah. So I, I, I would say, I don't lead with your strengths. <laughs> And, and when you find weaknesses in the school, offer your strengths. Don't just pick on their weaknesses. Okay. This is backing up to the other question in response. As far as support, be a hmm. safe place to ask difficult questions. Don't be intimidated by questions that you don't have the answers for right away. Mm -hmm. And just, or, or even just make assumptions that, oh, like this person's going to fall off the deep end because mm. <laughs> you're doubting or you're asking questions. Doubting is not wrong, and it can actually make you a stronger person in the end. Mm -hmm. So maybe not like, yeah, just listen and be willing to walk with those difficult questions rather than... Um, and just chalking the person off as, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask a question in response? How important is it that the person who's listening and offering that space, how important is it that they can offer answers? They don't need to an offer answers. Yeah. They just need to acknowledge that this is normal and we don't have answers for everything. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can say, I don't know, let's look at it together. Or mm -hmm. maybe there are some kinds of ways to answer that are not just directly, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it does, because there can be a breakdown sometimes. There is an interesting, I think people who tend to go after education, they can tend to be looking for, presenting as though they're looking for answers. And then the people who are trying to care for them say, I've got to give them answers, that's what they're asking for. What they're really looking for is just somebody to listen sometimes, and they're not very good at always communicating that. Okay. Okay, we'll take time for Ben's question here yet, and then we'll prepare for break. Yeah, so I had one question that's sort of, sort of on the flip side of what um, Joshua was asking here. What if, so most of the time at ABT we focus on preserving our Anabaptist theology and distinctives um, even when we're in schools from other Christian traditions. What if, and I don't, don't freak out because I don't have an, a specific example in mind, but what if I would go to one of these schools, come up with an idea, come in contact with an idea that I prayerfully consider and, and discover I think this is true and I was wrong. Mm. And this might even put me a little bit at odds with my community. How would you navigate Something, a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Just any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Is 
probably wiser people here than me. I've had this experience. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I failed to do in it, and I hope I learned from, is that um, I don't think I had listened sufficiently to the people of my community. Hmm. And um, I'm not suggesting that this is going to happen, but hmm. in my case, I should have actually taken the idea that I was wrestling with to my brothers and hmm. heard their side fully before I made, a, made such a conclusion on my own. I ended hmm. up regretting a conclusion that I had prayerfully made. And this mm -hmm. was a, it was a mistake of mine. So I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that you're making any kind of mistake. I just want to say don't skip that step hmm. of actually hearing why does your community hold the position they hold and like thoroughly understand that. Um, and then if you still feel like you need to make the, um, make a step away from what your community feels like, um, you're on a much better ground to do that. Mm -hmm. I might offer this too, just building off of that. <clears throat> um, Sometimes I can feel like I can fall into the trap of offering answers to questions that haven't been asked in my community. Okay, so so being sensitive to not make all of the great things and the the the, the concepts and things that I'm encountering out there primary so much as to say, as a leader in my community, part of what I'm there to do is to help clarify the questions that are really important to us right now, clarify the challenges, and only then to begin to offer solutions. But don't offer answers to questions that haven't already been asked, if that makes sense. It helps me stay grounded.